Welcome to the first meeting of the WAC for 2027. We're going to begin with opening remarks from our esteemed chair. Good morning. This is a, yeah, I like it. All right, what a turnout. You've had your coffee? And who says nobody comes into the office on Mondays anymore? Not to mention it's the morning. Technically, it's the summer. And you're prepping for a conference that is three years away. So let's just say I'm impressed by your dedication. But obviously, if you're here, you know that this is no ordinary meeting of the World Radio, Com Radio Communication Conference Advisory Committee. It's the very first meeting of the newly rechartered WAC for WRC 27. So I want to kick things off with a few acknowledgments. We're going to start with thanking Jane and Kimberly for serving as your chair and vice chair. Yes. Uh, Jane and Kim have both served in previous iterations of this committee, including in leadership positions and at the working level. And altogether, they've attended 11 World Radio Communications Conferences. Yeah, that's a lot. Uh, Kim also gets bonus points for beginning her career at the FCC in our Office of Engineering and Technology, <laughs> and later in the International Bureau. But both Jane and Kim have an incredible depth of experience, and they're going to prove invaluable to the committee and the work here at the commission. I also want to thank Greg Baker in our Office of International Affairs, because he's going to serve as the designated federal officer for the committee. That is work that's really important, although it often goes unseen. And I just want to say uh, we have a lot of gratitude for taking on that role. Finally, a big thank you to all of you for volunteering to serve on this committee. We've assembled an impressive group of members with a terrific mix of trade associations and world-leading companies. I know your time is valuable, and we're honored that you're going to be spending some of it with us. Uh, special thanks also to those of you who served on the WRC 23 version of the WAC, because you, show, you have shown us the way. You set the bar high. You know, with the help of this previous iteration of the committee, the US delegation in Dubai last year was able to advance our interests on a whole bunch of fronts, including securing more satellite spectrum and harmonizing our efforts with our peers around the world. The uh, delegation's wins are currently promoting innovation in unlicensed spectrum, namely for Wi-Fi, supporting 5G connectivity, paving the way for 6G, and bolstering United States leadership in the growing space economy. But no rest for the weary for those among you who spent weeks in Dubai over the holidays, I should add. Because the next World Radio Communication Conference in 2027 includes a whole lot of items that are key to ensuring our leadership in both 6G and space. In fact, more than 80% of the items on the agenda are satellite or space related, including new allocations for space research frequencies on the moon and beginning a longer term process of considering the spectrum regulatory framework for future commercial activity on the moon. It's literally way out there. There are four separate items looking at different uses of mobile satellite service technologies, including space-to-space -space links and direct-to-consumer mobile device operations. Now, as many of you know, here at the FCC, we've prioritized a lot of these uh, activities by setting up a new space bureau. And as luck would have it, several agenda items echo the work that we are doing here at the agency. And that includes the work we've already done to set up a framework for supplemental communication from space. Uh, or supplemental coverage from space. In fact, on this front, we were the first country in the world to set up such a framework that will make it easier to combine space-based networks with terrestrial networks, both of them together working to accomplish more than they could do on their own, and together ending things like dead zones and making our networks far more resilient in case of terrestrial disaster. So I just got back the day before yesterday <laughs> Jared's laughing because he was with me. And uh, morning suddenly feels like night because we were uh, with our counterparts in Japan, South Korea, and Singapore. And while there, we also met with others from Southeast Asia. And the conversations were all about the growth of the space economy 
and the future of terrestrial wireless and 6G. They're just issues that continue to loom large globally, and this group is going to look at several bands for regional and global IMT identification when it comes to 6G and for uh, WRC 27. All right, um, before closing, there's one more acknowledgement that I need to make, and sadly, it's a tragic one. On May 13, just three weeks ago, we lost Ethan Lucarelli unexpectedly. He was just 42 years old. As many of you may know, Ethan was our head of our Office of International Affairs. He had earlier served my office as an advisor, and he helped create the Office of International Affairs. He was also our point person at WRC 23, and he helped stand up this advisory committee. Now, Ethan was a brilliant lawyer and an even better person. As a measure of that, I have received so many messages from his regulatory counterparts around the world offering their condolences when they learned about his passing and telling me stories about their interaction, including at a whole lot of ITU events. Everyone who had the opportunity to work with Ethan admired and respected him, and I know that's true for many of you too. When I spoke about him and I announced his passing at the commission meeting just last, at the end of last month, I told a story about how a few years ago he received an award for being a promising young attorney, and this was back when he worked at a law firm. And when he received this honor, he gave an interview. And at a young age, he was asked to name his goals and guiding principles, which I can tell you even at my age is something that always terrifies me, as if you could sum it up. And yet he gave four. Number one, integrity, because you are only as good as your word. Number two, cooperation, because everything that is really good is done as a team. Number three, have fun. And number four, don't be a jerk. <laughs> I don't know, I think those seem like pretty good marching orders for this committee. And I think we can honor him by committing to them here today. So thank you to Ethan for showing the way. And thank you all for being a part of this effort. I appreciate the time this morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for those remarks and I know many of us did work with Ethan and um, condolences and uh, I do think those are probably some pretty good uh, things to think about as we move forward with this version of the WAC. Um, so I would like to uh, welcome my many familiar faces here. It's good to see everyone and uh, it is a long cycle. Uh, so we have four years coming up to do the work here. Uh, I would ask that as we go through this, let's continue to work collaboratively. Um, I'll speak for Kim here. You know, we do have a lot of experience. We're happy to help uh, wherever possible. Um, but let's see where we can reach consensus and collaborate and uh, make sure that we are providing good input to the FCC in terms of our recommendations from this committee to them. And I'll turn it over to Kim for any opening remarks from her. Thank you, Jane. Um, first, I'd just like to say that it's certainly an honor um, to be here, and I'd like to thank the chairwoman and OIA staff um, for appointing me as the vice chair of this important group. Um, and I'm looking forward to you know, helping develop the best possible um, draft US proposals on all of these agenda items before us. And you know, while it's tragic, as the chairwoman reported, that Ethan can't be with us here today, I do think that we should try to have our work embody you know, his spirit of positivity, respect for others, and collaboration. And I think we have, also as the chairwoman noted, a huge job ahead of us, particularly on the space side. We have 16 agenda items. Um, to look at. So I know that we're going to be very, very busy, but I think it's incredibly important work as we look in particular at, you know, how to more intensively use the spectrum allocations, you know, that already exist in many, many instances for satellite spectrum. So, but thank you, Jane, and I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. All right, so we'll move through the agenda now. The agenda for today's meeting is in WAC 27001. 
and we begin with opening remarks, approval of the agenda. We'll consider the uh, advisory committee charter and working methods. Move on to record keeping uh, presentation from NTIA uh, and the RCS process. Then we'll look to approve the advisory committee structure of the IWGs, cover future meetings and any other business. And with that, I would like to seek approval of the agenda as shown in WAC 27001. <laughs> Seeing no concerns, we'll move forward with taking the agenda as approved, and I'll turn it over to Kim uh, for the next item on the agenda. Okay, thank you, Jane. Um, so now we're going to turn to Greg for a presentation on um, the working methods and um, the advisory committee charter in um, document WAC 27, number two. Uh, Thank you, Kim. So WAC 2702 is uh, a document just uh, to note by the meeting. This is the uh, WRC uh, Advisory Committee Charter uh, as part of the, uh, the Federal Advisory Committee Act. Um, the key aspects, I think, are the, of the objectives and scope of activities. And what we're looking for is um, recommendations and pr for proposals uh, for the WRC 27 World Radio Conference. And as you can see uh, on the charter, uh, it, it encompasses uh, the, the items that are on the WRC 27 agenda. Um, it does not include um, some of the, the, um, <clears throat> the minutes of plenary, um, but this will be uh, further broken down uh, when we get into the structure on how we uh, recommend or actually look at these uh, agenda items. They'll be put into four informal working groups, and in those informal working groups, those will be structured based off our, um, our expertise in those, uh, those informal working groups. With that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Kim. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, and now we're gonna turn to Paula from OGC to... Can I do that first? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I'll continue on with the consideration of WAC 003. So this is the presentation of the working methods. Um, I'm gonna do uh, a, a brief portion at the beginning and then I'll hand it over to our Office of General Counsel uh, to provide further briefing uh, on this, uh, on matters related to FACA compliance. So moving on um, to, the, uh, to the second slide, uh, we're gonna discuss um, the objectives and scope of work, uh, the structures and preparatory process, the membership participation, uh, any logistics uh, related to uh, the meeting attendance virtual and in person. And then we'll also go over the, the listserv information and what information can be found on the, the website. And I'll pause right now for any questions from the audience or live questions uh, from the web. Yes, thank you. There is a one from live questions Please address the question, do people who were on IWG listservs during the previous cycle need to resubscribe to the IWG listservs for the new cycle? Uh, thanks, Alan. Yes, they will need to resubscribe to all the informal working group listservs. Moving on to slide number three. Uh, this is the objectives and scope of work. This kind of reiterates uh, what, what is in the, the WAC charter. And again, this is to recommend uh, proposals for the World Radio Conference uh, for 2027. 
Moving on to slide number four, the structure. Um, this, the structure of the IWGs and the WAC has changed a little bit uh, for this study cycle to reflect um, the, a satellite-heavy agenda. As you can see, what we'll do is on IWG1, we'll maintain the same structure with maritime, aeronautical, and radar services in IWG1. For the IWG2, we'll continue with mobile and fixed. And IWG3 and IWG4, um, we are grouping MSS and space science services, given the amount of agenda items, into IWG4. And IWG3 will consider FSS and the agenda item 7 uh, material. B moving on to the next slide, uh, the WRC preparatory process. This is an informatory slide kind of explaining how the WAC feeds into the overall WRC 27 proposals. Here, um, the FCC receives recommendations from the WAC and the WRC Advisory Committee, as well as puts any recommendations out for public notice for comment. Um, the NTIA is a, an observer in this process, and concurrently they have their own preparatory process through the IRAC in the Radio Conference Subcommittee. These proposals are, are considered. Um, FCC proposals may be sent over for, to NTIA to comment and vice versa, NTIA to FCC. Um, we then reconcile if there are any differences and that is then forwarded to State Department for a, a recommendation uh, that will be considered at our regional body, uh, the CTEL. And there we, f we use that as the basis to form our regional positions to the World Radio Conference 2027. Moving on to the next slide, the WAC and IWG meeting logistics. The WAC typically meets uh, up to three times per year. Um, they can meet more, maybe four times, but that is just a typical meeting. Uh, they're generally meeting in person, uh, but they're also uh, allow virtual attendance and participation. And the meetings are sent out uh, via public notice and the Federal Register. Uh, the IWG meetings typically meet uh, virtually, um, but they can meet in person. Uh, they'll meet multiple times. Uh, it's dependent on the workload, and these are also sent out for public notice. The, the WAC meetings and IWG meetings are usually before, let's say, a CTEL meeting, so they're scheduled around us developing a proposal and getting it into the deadline uh, through CTEL. And I'll pause here for any live questions. There are none. So right now I'd like to turn it over to Paula from OGC to give a briefing on um, the FACA compliance. Thanks very much, Greg. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll whip through things. Just, just one thing for clarification. When I'm done, my understanding is Doris will give the presentation on um, on records, is that right? Yes, I believe so. Okay. okay. So when I get to that little summary slide, I'll probably pretty much skip over it. So the Federal Advisory Committee is now recodified. It's actually at 5 U.S.C. 1001 at SEEK, and it governs the operations of most Federal Advisory Committee unless there's a statutory exemption. And FACA um, has guiding principles, openness in government, a diverse and balanced membership, which you folks definitely have, and public accountability. Next slide. Um, by statute, um, there has to be at least 15 calendar days notice of each committee meeting so that members of the committee and of the public can make arrangements to attend. And in addition, for convenience, since most people don't read the Federal Register, um, we publish um, meeting notices through um, PNs, through internet postings, and possibly other media. And meetings 
for purposes of the statute can include teleconferences, video conferences, and any other internet-based conferences, and of course, in-person meetings like today. Next slide. So FACA requires that meetings be open to the public. The public can submit written statements to the committee um, and may speak or address the committee if um, FCC or committee guidelines so permit and if there is time at the meeting. Um, this could be relevant to your folks under certain very limited circumstances involving trade secrets, classified government materials, or national security matters, meetings or portions of meetings may be closed so long as there is the approval of the agency head and prior notice in the Federal Register. Um, but if you were talking about something and you realize that it should be confidential, it's a trade secret, it's classified, whatever, you cannot simply, we cannot simply adjourn a meeting spontaneously. So please, if given the scope of your work, you see something in advance that you think could be problematic <clears throat> to be discussed in an open meeting, please let your FCC liaisons and your DFO know in advance. And if we feel it's appropriate, we will take a bunch of steps that are required to um, close that portion of the meeting. Next slide. Um, so we're required to keep minutes of meeting, including a record of everyone that's present and a, a copy and record of all documents uh, received, issued, approved. Um, these documents and all other committee documents um, should be, are required to be available for public inspection and copying. And the easiest way to obtain copies of these documents, if you want to look at things, if any of you want to look at things that were from prior meetings, um, just get in touch with your DFO and um, the DFO can arrange to make these documents available to you. Okay, next slide. Um, the committee chair and vice chair uh, they typically serve as the focal point for committee members, and they work with the agency to establish the informal working groups and to name the chairs of the different working groups. Um, and typically, your chairs will conduct the uh, public meetings and with a goal to build consensus and um, also can take suggestions for future meeting agendas. Next slide. Uh, your designated federal officer is a very important person in this process under the statute. Uh, the DFO is required to call the meetings, to approve the agenda, to attend the meetings, um, to step in if asked to chair and close the meetings, and to maintain all committee records, um, and also to take any minutes of meetings. Uh, let me mention here, and and Doris will emphasize this as well as well, that when you have any substantive uh, communications among the FCC and membership, or just among the membership, whether it's full committee communications or communications among working group members, uh, we need to keep copy. It, Again, if it's substantive, we need to keep copies of those emails. So please uh, copy the DFO on all of those com communications. And I also believe there is or will soon be a committee mailbox. And again, on substantive communications, both the DFO and your committee mailbox uh, which will be given to you by the DFO, um, should be copied. And that way we can, um, key, we can keep adequate um, records as required by other statutes. Okay, next slide. Okay, Doris will cover this again, copy the, the FACA 
mailbox for your group. Okay, next slide. Um, for the WAC and for most of our uh, advisory committees, a lot of business is conducted by informal working groups that will often make reports or tentative recommendations, and those would go to the full committee for consideration. Um, but here are just a couple of things that working that your working groups cannot do. You, oh, okay, sorry, let's start with what you can do. You can gather information, but not through formal surveys. You can develop work plans. You can draft preliminary views and proposals and discuss preliminary findings. Next slide. So here are the things that working groups can't do. Um, they can't function as the de facto parent advisory committee. Um, that means that once that you can make recommendations to the full committee, but the full committee has to take the final vote and action. And therefore decisions made by the working group um, are not binding on the full committee. They're just preliminary recommendations. Um, and as part of that, the working groups cannot make recommendations directly to the FCC. They all have to be routed through and approved by um, the full parent advisory committee, the full WAC. Okay, next slide. Yeah, here are some of the cannots. Cannots, as I said, the working group recommendations could not go directly to the FCC. Um, you have to be careful if you're reaching out to get information from the public or from other um, members of your industries, meaning you can't conduct surveys that would be subject to the Paperwork Reduction Act um, because that will require OMB approval and takes several months. So if there's something on which you want to get outside input, please get in touch with your DFO or other FCC liaisons, and um, they will work with you to figure out ways to get the information you want through other means, such as uh, more general public notices and the like. Okay. Um, most meetings conducted by the working groups are not subject to the open meeting and public notice requirements of FACA. Um, however, under recent changes to the GSA regulations governing FACA, which were just effective sometime last month, some working group meetings may be required to be open to the public. And um, in that event, the I and others in the Office of General Counsel would be communicating to the staff working with you about when um, and what kinds of working group meetings might need to be open. We're still, there's some ambiguity in the new regulations, to be honest, and we're still parsing through that. Um, and the final point here is um, for working group meetings, the number of committee members on the working group should be less than a quorum of the full committee. Okay, next slide. Okay, some clarifications about participation at meetings. Um, only one person from each organization should participate actively at a WAC meeting or um, and IWG meetings. Members from all organizations should have a fair chance to participate and voice their ideas. Um, and attendance at the meeting should be limited to those appointed officially as members for the working group meetings or their alternates. However, we know a lot of the substance of the meetings might be of interest to others as well. So therefore, um, 
it is permissible for observers from your your companies organizations to attend <clears throat> um, but the observers would not be able to actively participate or to vote um, if however there's an expert that's attending and um, the working group wants their um, their input then arrangements can be made to that effect but it would be basically on invita uh, on an invitation basis okay next slide um sort of following up on that if there's a particular issue before the working group on which um, another person at the member organization is better suited to speak then with prior notice to the chair of the working group, um, the organization could arrange for this additional sort of expert to be present at the meeting and to speak to that limited issue. Uh, but after speaking, um, the person that expert speaker, um, if not a member, would sort of revert to observer status. And um, if for any um, reason you have you're having a closed working group meeting and there is a third party that's not a member who's attending by invitation then after that third party non-member gives a presentation um that person should leave when the working group itself if if the meeting is closed begins to discuss any private deliberations um, and finally, just a reminder that each organization gets only one vote, regardless of how many alternate or member observers are in attendance. Okay, next slide. Um, very briefly, um, the commission's ex party rules apply to presentations made to um, an advisory committee or its working groups. And a presentation between committee or working group members and FCC staff or commissioners, unless the presentation is otherwise exempted pursuant to a public notice issued by the Bureau or the Commission. And typically, um, your staff here, the FCC staff working with you, will issue such an exemption. Notice and just a little note to staff, if that has not been done, we have a standard form that I can share with you. Um, and just noting that if you are a member and there is an exemption that's issued, it applies only to situations where you might be talking with a staff person or a commissioner in the in the role of presenting the views of the WAC or the WAC's working groups. But if you are presenting the views of your own member organization, then the advisory group exemption that staff may have issued would not apply to you. So it just depends. If you're operating in your role as a member of the WAC or working group, the exemption applies. If not, and you're just representing the views of your organization, you know, the, the exemption's just not applicable. And according to point here, um, apparently there has been a public notice um, exemption issued to cover the WAC in this term. Okay, next slide. Um, okay, this is the last slide here. I just wanted to mention that there are times that members of the WAC or someone on a working group um, may want to communicate views about matters that are pending before the WAC but have not yet been resolved by committee vote. And if that's the case, you as the member should make clear in any presentation that the views you're expressing on current topics are your individual views not those of the full committee or working group. If 
the matter has not yet been voted and resolved. Um, and the reason we say this is that we just want to be clear when people are speaking with the public um, or having an interview, going on TV, speaking on a radio program, that um, to be clear that your individual views are not necessarily the views of the committee as a whole and vice versa. Um, so if you know that you're going to be going um, in some sort of a public forum um, that will mention your association with the WAC or with a working group, uh, you may want to contact your DFO or other FCC staff in advance um, to just make sure that there's adequate clarification that your own policy views or those of your organization um, are distinct from positions taken by um, the full committee in situations where the WAC itself um, has not taken um, a public vote. And that, I think, is all that I have. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, so I think Doris would be up next. Helen, are there any questions? Okay, uh, so no questions on the working methods, so we'll move to item number four of the agenda on records keeping. And Alan, if you could show WAC 27, document three, slide 14, I believe it was, and we'll turn it over to Doris uh, to cover uh, records keeping. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Doris Gamble, and I work in the records management branch under the office of the chief information officer at the FCC. Thank you all for granting me some time during this meeting to go over some record keeping responsibilities. The National Archives and Records Administration oversees all records management programs for federal agencies. And back in 2019, NARA came to the FCC to review our record keeping practices with a specific focus on permanent records. And as a result of this assessment, we established some procedures to help ensure that we're meeting all of our requirements. As you all know, the Federal Advisory Committee Act requires that, every, that advisory committees create and maintain accurate and complete records of their activities, including meetings, discussions, and recommendations. And these records are essential for transparency and accountability, and they may eventually be subject to public disclosure. So to fulfill our responsibilities under the FACA, it's important that we all do our part to create and maintain these records, and this includes taking notes during meetings, per preserving relevant documents and materials, and ensuring that these records are properly organized and managed. Uh, Federal Advisory Committee records are to be maintained in accordance with General Record Schedule 6.2, Federal Advisory Committee records. Uh, your DFO is gonna share an electronic copy of the disposition authority, and that's gonna outline all the different types of documentation that are required for us to accession to the National Archives um, in accordance with the retention schedule or at the termination of this committee. Um, and we'll help walk you through what that means and what that entails. Um, it's important to note that the GRS, the disposition schedule, is media neutral, meaning it applies to all records regardless of their format. So they'll take paper, audiovisual, electronic, anything that pertains to the WAC um, that is a record that needs to be transferred. Um, the, generally speaking, though, all documentation is already in electronic format, so uh, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, what does this mean to all of you? We try to keep it pretty simple. All you're going to be required to do from a record keeping perspective it is, is ensure that the DFO has a complete and accurate record that documents the WAC deliberations and decisions. The work you all do is very important and we want to make sure it's documented and preserved. So we've established, as Paula referred to, a uh, mailbox specific to the committee, and every committee member should copy the DFO and the mailbox on all, me all substantive 
substantive uh, emails pertaining to the business of the committee or its working groups. And at the appropriate time, we're going to work with the DFO to make sure that this mailbox and any other related records get transferred to NARA in compliance with the disposition schedule. So as a reminder, uh, we're all responsible for creating and maintaining accurate and complete records. So if you have any questions or concerns about your responsibilities as far as record keeping goes, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or to your DFO. And that is all I have. Thank you very much for your attention and time. Uh, thank you. And Alan, if you could put up slide uh, for WAC 27003, slide 22 and slide 23, uh, we're just going to have Greg cover a couple more pieces regarding some of the information. Uh, thank you, Jane. So this just co uh, covers the uh, the FCC listserv information. Um, I think it was highlighted you will need to resubscribe. Uh, we have the four IWG listservs um, and the the method for subscribing. It'll be detailed on actually, Alan, could you scroll into the next slide? All this information can be found on the uh, website fcc.gov forward slash wrc-27. Uh, it also include information related to the public notices. Uh, the informal working groups, the meeting dates are posted in the, uh, the public notices as well as information on how to subscribe to the listserv. And do we have an email alias for the DFO or should it go directly to Greg at this point? Yes, the alias for the DFO is WRC-27 at FCC.gov. Work 27, that work slash 27 at FCC.gov, correct? Dash 27. Dash 27. So uh, if there is any substantive issue, uh, please make sure you copy that email alias. And as we go through the IWGs, uh, we'll make sure that, please make sure there are minutes taken for the IWG meetings as well. Uh, to make sure that we comply with record keeping. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kim. There's no questions on uh, record keeping. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we turn to agenda item five of the agenda, where we will hear a presentation from NTIA on how the RCS process works. So Charles Glass, I believe you're online to speak to us. I am, and good morning to everyone. So uh, two issues to cover very briefly. Uh, under the IRAC, we have two groups which are dealing with WRC issues. Uh, the first is uh, an ad hoc committee that is working on the implementation from WRC 23. Um, so we're developing our recommendations to the FCC on implementation of the outcomes of WRC 23 to uh, the table of allocations in the United States. Within the RCS, uh, we are actively working on development of preliminary proposals at this point. We have five working groups, uh, unlike uh, your, your structure. Working group one is dealing with all of the satellite issues and Dr. Brian Patton is heading up that group. Working group two is on fixed mobile and radio location issues, which is headed up by Ms. Amy Sanders. Working group three is addressing the science issues and Shelley Rose Haskins is addressing that, is leading that group. Working group four is the general issues except for agenda item 10 and Ms. Aisha Wilson is heading up that group. And working group five is future conference agenda items and Mr. Eric Lee is in charge of that group. We usually do a separate group on future conference agenda items uh, we hold separate meetings on that and gather the agency views, although there are times that the technical groups, so in this case, working group one, two, or three, may forward, forward work from those groups to working group five uh, for consideration uh, for future conference agenda items. Um, we also, under our working group structure, have uh, rolled in the work for WRC uh, plus one, uh, so 31 or 32, uh, whatever it ends up being. Um, and so the work for, for those items are also spread out among our working groups uh, to be addressed by those groups. Uh, we will not develop 
preliminary views uh, for those particular items per se, uh, but we will develop uh, potential government views which will be passed on to the FCC and the relevant groups uh, as work is being developed uh, in our uh, domestic process. So that's uh, where we're at. We are currently, uh, we have one approved preliminary view on agenda 113, um, which is going to the IRAC for approval uh, uh, this week. And then we, we have several that will be considered at our upcoming meeting on Thursday, um, a, a handful of items uh, for approval. And uh, those would then be considered uh, either electronically or at the uh, next month's uh, IRAC meeting. Um, we understand that we pretty much have a deadline of, of the July RCS meeting to get our preliminary views over in time for the IWGs uh, to, to consider things for us to get it through our process to get it over um, so that uh, at, at your next WAC meeting, you'll have an opportunity to, to uh, have reviewed and potentially approve uh, any uh, preliminary views based off of our input. So uh, that's my brief introduction of the RCS process and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Charles. That was very informative. Are there any questions in the room or on the email? Okay, great. So Jane, back to you. Thank you. We'll now move to number six on today's agenda, and that is WAC document, WAC 27 document four, related to the advisory committee structure of the informal working groups. So Alan, if you could please show document four. The committee structure on the first page just starts with contact inf information for myself, uh, Kim and Greg as our DFO. On page three, we have IWG two, I, IWG one, which covers maritime, aeronautical, and radar services, and the agenda items that have been provisionally assigned to this group, as well as the ITUR lead group. So 1.8, 1.9, and then we have the ones that are, are assigned to each of the uh, IWGs. On the next page, IWG2, oh, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't say uh, Kim and Nick will be chair and vice chair of IWG1, respectively, and thank you. For IWG2, we have Donalene and Reza, uh, and that group has got 1.7, 1.10, and then uh, the same ones, uh, 2, 4, 8, and 10. And then we get into the, uh, the more heavily subscribed uh, in terms of workload. IWG3, Alex and Ryan, uh, and then here we have 1.1 through 1.6. And then moving on to IWG4, Damon and George, 1.1, 1 1.2 uh, through 1.19, as well as the uh, agenda items that are assigned to all of the groups. As Greg noted, originally, Agenda item seven has also been assigned to IWG three at this point. Um, so I have a couple more comments, but do we have any questions or comments on the structure of uh, proposed for the IWG? I do note that this is, uh, you know, unusually balanced this cycle, uh, given the the agenda item for the conference as well. Uh, so IWG three and IWG four will be very, very busy. Um, and good luck to them on that. But uh, any comments or questions or concerns with this before I move uh, with IW, uh, WAC 27 document four? Alan, anything else? Okay, so just a few other comments. Um, first, there is a lot of work to do over the cycle. Uh, we'll start with preliminary views. There are already dates for the IWGs posted on the FCC's website, uh, a schedule of meetings for each of the IWG. Uh, please make sure you note those and begin participation as those activities kick off. Um, we'll work with Greg uh, to make sure that there's a template for the PVs and the proposals 
basically making sure that the formatting, et cetera, is correct. Um, as we get into uh, the proposal stage in particular, we'll need to make sure that we're marking up the, the enforced version of the radio regs, so we'll make sure that that information is available for anybody putting those proposals together. I do encourage um, people attending the IWGs to offer to uh, take minutes. Uh, <laughs> It's not glamorous at all, uh, but it's a necessary part of the work, and um, it can be done pretty quickly, especially once we have the uh, for sort of format up and running. Uh, but please participate in the development of the PVs and proposals. Uh, please go into those discussions cr uh, constructively. Um, as Charles noted, we already are expecting one over from uh, the RCS. So when the IWGs consider those, uh, you can take that. Uh, and those get reviewed and then uh, decide whether to mark up that one uh, or uh, start with a new one. But we will be receiving some from the RCS as well, uh, PVs and, and proposals going forward. Uh, and those will be directly assigned to the respective IWG. So any other comments or questions with respect to uh, the structure of the committee? And if not, I'll be looking to approve. WAC 27, document four. Any concerns with taking document WAC 27004 as approved in the room or on the live stream? Okay, with that, we'll take document four as approved and Kim, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Jane. Um, so under agenda item seven, we'll take a look at the future meetings that we have Scheduled, we'll look at WAC document five um, as soon as Alan pulls it up here. But as many of you know, we already have a CTEL me meeting scheduled in September, and that will guide um, our preparatory work. Um, the CTEL PCC2 meeting is scheduled for September 22nd through 27th. So all of our work will key off of that. Um, so we're going to target the September 2nd translation deadline for that meeting. So that means that we have tentatively scheduled the next WAC for August 5th to allow enough time for um, the FCC's public notice process after the WAC approves the proposals to get any further um, public comment and then also for reconciliation um, with the NTIA RCS side so we can get as many preliminary views and possibly preliminary proposals um, to the September CTEL meeting. So any questions or comments on WAC document five for our high level schedule for the, the work of the advisory committee? Okay, and we'll continue. I personally find that document a very good reference, so we'll continue fleshing that out more as um, more meetings are scheduled. And then, um, as Greg had already mentioned earlier, um, the FCC's um, work website is a, an incredibly valuable tool, and that's where you'll find all of the, you know, all of the documents we've considered here, as well as all of the, you know, work that's underway in the the IWG meetings, so it's certainly a good place to, to bookmark and, and go to frequently. So with that, I will turn the floor over to Jane for any other business. Thank you. I have a few closing comments in any, any other business, but first, uh, any other business from the floor or from the live stream? So I see two here in the room, so Greg, if we could get the microphone. and. Alan, if you could look through the live stream and let us know as well. Hey, good morning, everyone. John Syverling, the American Radio Relay League. Will this WAC end before WRC 27? Will it be reconstituted, and will we have to reapply? If the answer to those three questions is yes, when will that be? Thank you. I thought you were going to ask if today's meeting was going to end, and I was like, we're <laughs> almost there, John. <laughs> uh, so I'll make sure that Greg has it, that we get this correct. Or Greg, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, so it, it's every two years we have to renew the charter. So I would expect uh, January 2026, so two years into the study cycle, we would have to renew the charter and then reapply. And, and Greg, I believe that we're also still accepting applicants on a rolling basis as well. Yes, so we 
there are we continue to accept, accept applications on a rolling basis. There's no deadline for application. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Brennan Price. I uh, am the member of the committee uh, for Viasat. Uh, during the uh, uh, vetting process uh, and discussion with um, the uh, Ethics Office of the Office of General Counsel, uh, I indicated that uh, I personally hold uh, an amateur radio license, a general mobile radio service license, and a marine radio operator permit, where I could be an officer aboard a ship someday uh, doing radio stuff if this regulatory lawyer thing ever doesn't work out. Uh, at any rate, uh, I, uh, given that there are some amateur uh, bans under consideration and some agenda items, I was asked to disclose these licenses to the licenses to the committee uh, and recuse myself from uh, any proceedings that might impact my interest. Uh, I've conducted a review of the agenda. It appears that a few frequency bans on agenda item 1.8 and 1.15 uh, would be impacted here, uh, but I uh, take the floor to make that disclosure and to uh, identify uh, where I'll be making that recusal. And I thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments from the floor or on the live stream? OK. Um, so John, we're almost at the end here, promise. Um, so just uh, in general, you know, we have a lot of expertise here within the committee membership. Um, many of you have known in this setting for many, many years, many, many cycles. Um, so please take advantage of those resources. Uh, Kim and I are available as well. Um, we have some great FCC staff with a lot of expertise here as well. Uh, let's do what we can to put the U.S. in the best possible position to succeed uh, throughout the study cycle and at the upcoming well, our, our not so upcoming work uh, in 2027. Um, just logistically, I believe there's a sign-in sheet. Uh, for those of us here in the room, please make sure that you uh, sign in uh, so we have those, those records of attendance. Um, and it is really good to see everyone. Um, I know we often have differences of views in terms of uh, recommendations and positions, but uh, we have a great group of experts here, and uh, I'm looking forward to working with each and, each and every one of you during the cycle. Uh, Kim, uh, we do have one comment, and then Kim, if you want to make any as well. Alan, go ahead with a question. Yes, uh, one comment, a question came in from the chat. Will federal participants be allowed in the IWG meetings given how slide 18 is worded? Uh, yes, they can, uh, federal participation our participants can attend as observers to the meeting. And, and there were uh, the rules regarding observers and needing to be invited to speak, et cetera. So um, traditionally, we do have federal participants as observers um, and just ask that you follow the guidance in terms of observer status. Uh, Kim, any comments before we adjourn? Okay, with that, um, we adjourn today's meeting and uh, please attend those IWG sessions and we look forward to seeing you at the second meeting of the, the WAC and that will be uh, confirmed through Federal Register Notice and PN uh, expected the first week of August. Thank you. Uh, the meeting is expected the first week of August. We uh, adjourn the meeting. <laughs>